Hello, everybody. Hi, I'm Bill Harris, and welcome to Life Questions. I'm your host, and you know, we've been watching this program or doing this program, and hopefully you've been watching it for the last several weeks now, and we are all about getting answers to solve your life's questions. Many of you have sent us your questions about your life to discuss on this program, and for that we are eternally grateful. For others of you, you may want to send us your questions and haven't done so, but we will have the answer to how you should send us your questions in a few minutes. Now, each week on this program, we assemble a panel of local ministers to address your questions from a biblical perspective. And as we begin our discussion, I'd like to introduce you to this fine panel here to address your questions. First of all, we have with us Pastor David Nicholson of the First Church of Christ, Fort Recovery. Secondly, we have Pastor Julian Burke from the Living Faith Temple. Next, Pastor Lynn Passett, an ordained minister in the Finley and Upper Sandusky area, and Pastor Kelly Waltz of the Church at Allentown. And um, we're delighted that you are here for our discussion and hopefully your answers to some of these questions are going to really bring new life to people's lives. Right. Happy to have you with us. Now, as we begin, we were talking early before going on air about the struggles in Judas's life. Judas, of course, carried the money bag, as, this, <laughs> as the Bible says. He was the treasurer for Jesus' ministry, but he wasn't always up to snuff in terms of being truthful. And so he eventually betrayed the Lord and, and wound, wound up taking his own life. This was a follower of Christ, a follower of Christ who took his own life. What could we extract out of this? Was he destined to do this? Was this of his own free will? What's the situation here? And I believe you were the first one to bring this discussion up to us earlier. Yeah, it, it, this question is, I don't think there's any one foolproof answer. Uh, I think there's several ways you can look at it. The Bible doesn't always give you an exact answer when you go through it, and, and sometimes it, things can be interpreted differently. But Judas, uh, as we recall, actually was rewarded or paid to turn Jesus in to the authorities. 30 pieces uh, of silver. Prior to his mm -hmm. crucifixion, and uh, he even tried to give that money back. He, mm -hmm. he felt guilty over what he had done after he had kissed Jesus on the cheek and turned him in. Was that true remorse, you think, then? I, I think he tried to show remorse. I think he felt scared for his own life, knowing that he had just betrayed the one and only. Mm -hmm. um, was he predestined? That's always the question yeah. that people want to know. And yeah. I think to a degree you can say he was because someone had to fulfill that role. To, Christ wasn't just going to be captured. They had tried that many times before, mm -hmm. but they never had any charges really to bring against him successfully. Mm -hmm. So someone had to play the dirty role and, mm -hmm. and that's kind of where Judas fell into line and I, I think in a way he was predetermined but he didn't know that. None of the disciples really knew their roles back then when you start backing off and looking at things from a thousand miles away. Mm -hmm. So, Or two thousand years away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's, it's a tough answer to really get but I know everyone when we were talking earlier kind of had their own take but mine is I think it was a predestined, predetermined role for him. He just didn't know what that role was as he was going about it. Interesting. Who else has a perhaps different perspective? Or maybe you agree. Well, again, I think as God knows the future, he just worked that into his plan. I don't think Judas, God determined that Judas was going to be the one to turn Jesus in, that he was going to be the thief. He was going to do that. And I don't think Jesus did. He knew, according to prophecy, that one would. He, uh, he may not have known which one until the very end mm -hmm. when he told Judas, go do what, what, what you do, you, do what, you're, what you've already planned to do, go do it. Mm -hmm. You've already made the arrangements and then Judas did it. But God put it in prophecy that there would be one because God knew. Um, God knows the end of time. Uh, he knows when Jesus is going to return, what the world's going to look like. We don't know that. And Jesus didn't know that, but um, he may know it now. I mean, he's up there, <laughs> but uh, he uh, uh, he may not have known, but he was guided in who he selected, and God, uh, the Father, guided him. But Judas still had that free will. He could, or he, he did not have to, but he could do 
what he did. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there, and we're, again, scripture's not clear, is it, you know, which, which way it is, so. Okay, Pastor Walsh, what's your take? Well, and I agree that I think it was, for me, God has one plan since the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. And even though Judas had free will, the choice that he could make, even if he'd made another choice, that's still not going to derail what God's plan was. Mm -hmm. It would have just maybe played out a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that Judas had a choice. And I think that he, some say that they believe that he was trying to force Jesus's hand mm -hmm. because what people expected was a warrior, somebody to come and uh, free them mm -hmm. and immediately almost. Socially if we think and politically. In, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if we think in this day and age, you know, what is it that we're looking for? We want things immediately resolved. We don't want to have to wait. They'd been suffering. They were ready. You know, was Judas just forcing his hand? And then he realized taking matters into his own hands, he messed it up so much and that he was taking all the guilt and taking everything in and thought suicide was the way to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pastor, this happened some 2,000 years ago. What should we walk away with for us to live by in this 21st century? What, we, what should we get out of well, this? Well, I think looking at it as the full capacity of our lives in general, that we all are a piece to the puzzle that gives God glory. And if God says, for I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Um, so he already has plans. I think we, if we can look at ourselves as a whole piece in the scheme of things, we have to then take not just the season of Judas's life where he was in that moment, but how did he get there? How did we get where we're at? What brought us to that point from the time we grew up with the parents we had, the culture we lived in, what was acceptable and not acceptable, to get us to a place of have we received the Lord yet in our lives? Um, have we fully um, received him or have we not and why? And then for Judas to be, think that it was okay to be deceitful or a traitor, why was that okay with his heart in that time? Because something along the way, he must have had that in him even from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you liken this somewhat to another situation in the Bible. You well, Jacob the deceiver. Now, we can look at it as, okay, we've got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all predestined with a full identity of being uh, so wonderful for the Lord as chosen vessels. Mm -hmm. And yet Jacob was a deceiver. He had some character fall. He had some things within him that we all have in some way, shape, or form that, um, that needed to be addressed, and God had to work with him and deal with him. I, even his mother influenced that to deceive his father. However, the mother knew who he was. Mm -hmm. The mother mm -hmm. knew that he was predestined to be the one, even though he was not the firstborn. So he here we have a whole big thing with prophecy, how God uses and uh, th people in situations of life um, to really um, just draw us into that our imperfections is what ultimately he uses to bring good out of bad. And so if, if Jacob, who we know had all of these faults, I think eventually as he continued to be a deceiver, just as Judas was a deceiver, God then, he had a choice, and then he got a wrestling match and twisted him. But at that moment was when he decided to fully receive and accept who he was mm -hmm. and got it. And it took all that battling for him to get there. How many people have to get to a point to get through that battling or that moment to fully receive who God already pre-planned them to be? Did Judas fail to do that? Was God working on his heart? Or, you know, there's a prophecy. There, he fulfilled what he was set out to do. Mm -hmm. And after that, we, have, we cannot change what God has in, set in, in, yeah. in plans. I think, it's, I think it's important to remember that, as she just said, God uses everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not looking for the perfect person. Mm -hmm. If he was, I certainly wouldn't be sitting here today. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, nor were his disciples. They were tax uh, collectors and they were uh, just not the cream of the crop. Mm -hmm. you know, when, when he asked them to come be a fisher of men, most of them had no clue what he was really asking them to do, um, nor do we always know what God is asking us to do. So uh, I guess my advice to anybody out there watching right now is don't feel like you are not important to God. Don't feel like you don't have a purpose or a role because every single one of us does. It's up to us to acknowledge it, find it, and use it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and you, as you said, that none of us is perfect, 
And uh, my background as a, as a non-church goer as a kid, um, not until my mid-20s, um, but when we did go, we went to one of the big, uh, I grew up in Kalamazoo, Michigan, cathedrals. I call them, they're stone walls or, you know, three feet thick, and they had all the stained glass windows and all these Bible characters have little halos over their head that identify mm -hmm. them as Bible characters in the stained glass. And so when I started going, it was like, oh, these people are perfect. And then I read the Bible. And <laughs> uh, none of them, the Bible is clear that only Jesus was perfect. Mm -hmm. That none of the, uh, uh, Paul and Peter, uh, uh, Paul writes about, had a big argument, verbal argument over Timothy, uh, over John Mark, uh, taking him back on the mission field mm -hmm. because um, John Mark had left in the middle of the mission trip. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Peter and Paul, um, they, uh, Paul and Barnabas that was over John Mark, but then Peter and Paul had a disagreement over eating with Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And Peter withdrew uh, from eating with Gentiles when some Judean Christians came and he no longer would eat mm -hmm. with the Gentiles. And so th they wrestled with their old self mm -hmm. and their new self. And uh, it's, it's, uh, they weren't perfect. So Jesus was the only one. So. Uh, um, now, Judas played the role of Joseph's brothers. You know, mm -hmm. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver, but um, he, um, th th there, Judas was for 30. But there was remorse. But, um, you know, again, that, th the big story, there's the big story that goes all the way through, so. It's just yeah. interesting to see, too, how money is a big factor. Mm -hmm in terms of betrayal and the like. Uh, you just mm -hmm. mentioned two cases uh, there. The um, how does that propel itself into today's world, money being a factor in Christianity, in a positive or negative sense? Mm. Any ideas? Well, I think those who aren't normal Christians in the church on an everyday, every week basis, they tend to look at the church as being uh, this huge drawing of money and what are they using that money for? They, they just see the church as a big dollar sign and all they're after is my money when I walk into that church. Uh, they don't stop and think about the fact that they have an electric bill like everybody else and they have staff to pay like everybody else. Uh, you want to do your mission work so you need to be tucking money away to try and send people off to do mission work and, and all the printing of the uh, bulletins each week mm -hmm. and, and keeping the general church afloat. You know, it takes money. And, they don't and run on the hallelujah. Huh? No, and people <laughs> see that plate being passed by yeah. and uh, all they see are the dollar signs, but they don't really stop and think about all the things that money is going to good use for, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Unfortunately. Well, listen, mm -hmm. I want to pause right now. Can you hold your point? We'll mm -hmm. come back to that as soon as we um, take a break. We're going to just take a break. We want to give you an idea of how you, if you've not done so, can send us your questions so our panel of experts can answer your questions. We'll be right back after this. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back. We want to continue our discussion. Uh, we've turned that discussion to money in the church. And just before we took a break, Pastor, you were going to, to, to mention. Well, one. I think what uh, some people think, especially outside of the, of the church, uh, is because of news media highlighting when there is uh, misappropriation of money or abuse by a, a pastor or minister. Um, in when I began ministry, the uh, outbreak of the um, can, anyway. Jimmy Swagger, Jimmy Swagger and, and, and Jimmy, Jimmy Baker, Baker, yeah, Jimmy Baker uh, incident with the hundreds of dollars worth for a doghouse, 
um, the embezzlement that he got in trouble with, and some of these other high profile ministers when there's budget or misappropriations of money and it's stressed in the news media. And um, again, uh, people elevate ministers and pastors so that sin cannot be part of our lives and we struggle with it. And if the apostles mm -hmm. struggled with it, mm -hmm. um, I, I think one of the passages that allowed me to think, even consider going in the ministry was Romans 7, where Paul talks about what I want to do, I don't do, what I do, I don't want to do, and he struggled. Mm -hmm. um, and then we go to 1 John, and John says, if we say we don't sin, we lie, we mm -hmm. deceive ourselves. And uh, I heard a sermon, and the preacher was projecting that onto us, and I said, well, wait a minute, John is saying, if I say I don't sin, the apostle John, because he used the pronoun including himself. Mm -hmm. If we, if I say I don't sin, and, uh, and so because of the news media, uh, it's just, it's blanketed over the church, you know, and, and unfortunately, um, sometimes there's not checks and balances. Most, most congregations, I believe, have checks and balances. Um, and, but that minute number become a, a profile, so. Well, I, I can chime in about there are principles set in place in the Word of God regarding money. And yes. the Bible does say it is the root of all evil. So mm -hmm. God knows in our fleshly nature and our humanist, humanistic ways that we default back to what we tend to know in the familiarity of humanness is that we're probably going to misuse whatever. However, when we learn his ways and become more like him in the image of him, we can kind of utilize that to question some of the tendencies that we have as humans. And so therefore, if we're going to use money, we have to do it intentionally in a way where God's kingdom is set up according to giving. However, this kingdom is set up for just money in general because we know we need that. So if we're going to do anything, let's look at what the word says, obedience is greater than sacrifice. Sure. He, it, he wants us to sacrifice what we normally wouldn't, which is money that everybody needs. It's a, a necessity that he says, I want you to give and let it be that you give it for the right reasons. And so when we give to church, we give for tithing. All of that it has a good uh, intention behind it because you're giving it to God, not just to the church. And that's with a what people attitude. with a cheerful <laughs> attitude, and people <laughs> fail to realize that if they're not really in that lifestyle of living for God because they haven't had a relationship with God or understanding of what His Word says, because of course, without receiving Christ, you have no understanding of what the Word even is talking about, and so you get mixed up or under with that understanding. However, when we're specific and we give that, we realize there's benefits in obeying His Word. So sure. if we give tithing, we know that there is a reward for that, whether it come back to us financially or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just want to speak to a personal um, experience uh, with starting Guiding Light. I didn't have two pennies to rub together. God said, do it. Now, I'm going to obey him in doing it, but where's the money? Well, the money comes as you continue to move forward and walking by faith. Yeah. Yeah. And in addition to that, I was basically crucified because I give tithing off of donations because I'm going to obey the Lord. If you give this money, I'm still going to mm -hmm. give 10% back in mm -hmm. to the church mm -hmm. because what does it do? He guarantees us that if we give out of our obedience, he will make sure we're covered. Well, he'll make sure it's like the five loaves and two fishes. It's going to come back to us. So I have no problem with the people that have prosperity if they're using it wisely. If they've made it there, they've done some good things. They've done some wise things and, they, and they've used the principles wisely. So why hinder the church that grows and develops and does good in, in, because they're following God's principles? There's blessings. Yeah. He's a God of blessing and not of curse. Yeah. So mm -hmm. therefore we can use money as a blessing. There mm -hmm. are over 2,300 scriptures in the Bible that pertain to money. Uh, there's more said in the New Testament about uh, money than heaven and hell combined. Mm -hmm. And um, God is obviously trying to talk to us yes. about our money. Yes. And we really need to listen. Good stewards. Yeah, we, 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 we good stewards. And uh, I, I did seminars on this while I was a um, financial advisor. Uh, after I left television, I became a financial advisor. And um, it is, I, I think it's so true that when we follow God's principles, we will see mm -hmm. uh, blessings come our way. And sometimes we get our own notions in the way. and. 
And uh, that's what can lead to trouble, even in the media, right. as you were just saying. And, and, and there's misappropriation of funds. There's all kinds of stuff. And then we can go broke. We can get into bankruptcy. We can get into high debt because we have our own desires versus what God wants for us. Well, and there's also another way of looking at it, and that's when uh, Jesus was picking his disciples. He said, come follow me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And instantly, instantly, they dropped what they were doing yeah. and they ran to Jesus. How yeah. many of us are willing yeah. to do that oh. and walk away from our homes, walk away Praise from our lives business, to go do what we're being called to do? Yeah. And she just mentioned, you know, she started a church with basically nothing. Mm -hmm. That, that speaks volumes for you as a person yeah, yeah. because you followed God's word. Mm -hmm. And I know that when I first became a Christian and I started giving back money to God, I was still caught up in the world because I, my relationship wasn't as strong as it was going to be uh -huh. and continued to grow. So I wasn't giving 10%. And I was holding back because I wanted to make sure I had enough to do the things I wanted to do. Yeah. And then as my walk has continued to grow, I've started to give more and more and more and found out that this really works. Mm -hmm. When I give back to God what he blessed me with, he brings greater blessings to me that are more valuable than having money in the bank that's just sitting there not doing anything yeah. or being spent on experiences that has no lasting impact on my life or to make me a better person so that God can continue to use me in greater ways. Mm -hmm. And then when he said, you know what? You're gonna retire from teaching after 30 years and I'm doing the calculations. I'm thinking, <laughs> wait a minute. Okay, my house will be paid off, my car will be paid off, but I'm gonna lose. If I just teach one more year, I can make $6,000 more in my retirement. And God said, no, you're going. I said, but if I teach just a little <laughs> bit longer, and he said, no, you're going. So I quit at 30, and people that I worked with were amazed. They're like, why aren't you going? Because you'll have that much more in your retirement. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, because God said no. And you know what? I continue to give at the same level, and he has blessed me in amazing ways, and I don't have any worries because I'm glorifying him by giving everything back to him that he tells me to. And mm -hmm. You know, I, I think uh, another key to this whole conversation is being able to teach that, communicate that, convey that mm -hmm. to the congregation mm -hmm. so they understand that God is, that God is not only concerned about the 10% that we give, mm -hmm. Even though the 90% belongs, we think, to us, it still belongs to him. <laughs> it still is. Yeah. Oh. And he, he wants to have say so in what we do with that, but on our behalf and for, for our benefit. For our good. And, and so many times uh, I think we take that 10% and give it to him, and we take that 90% and we just run off in a corner somewhere, say, aha, this is mine. And that's not, that's not the case. We may possess it, but we don't own it. God says yeah. the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Well, God has promised that we will not go hungry. We will not go without a roof overhead or the clothes on our back. Mm -hmm. You know, we will have what we need. And in our culture, it's determining what is a want and mm -hmm. what is a need. <laughs> and um, That distinction needs to be made. <laughs> right. I had almost 10 years in one career, and I came home and told my in the vending machine business, and I came home and told my wife, I said, well, I'm gonna to go to Bible college and become a minister. And when we told the family, uh, they were ready to rescue uh, my wife and son from this kook. And- uh, Intervention was probably- Intervention, intervention. yes. They needed, <laughs> they needed an intervention because I was in a career. And um, the, uh, in fact, when we went to look at the Bible college, didn't have money for school or anything. Uh -huh. And, uh, but went there, I was supposed to go to New Orleans uh, for a job interview. I'm gonna be flown down there and for in a vending company. And we went to uh, Baltimore and to look at the college and um, wound up finishing. And with work study and everything like that, had a surplus of money hmm. to give to another student Isn't that um, mm -hmm. and the Lord provided a job for me with benefits 
Uh, second shift worked out beautiful, so the Lord provided yeah. all the way. And that. most people go, well, but we live in this culture where we watch media, mm -hmm. and what is where they say you deserve, um, you, you owe it to yourself, um, you know, and we have people that camp out a week ahead of time when a new product comes on the market, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> waiting, even though they have have a similar product in their hand or at <laughs> home or in their driveway they have that's something that's working uh -huh. and everything else but no you deserve this new vehicle or you deserve this new product it's called marketing marketing that's right it's, it's marketing <laughs> it's, it's what it is but but our whole culture is wrapped around that and so uh, you deserve this well just because they make it doesn't mean you have to buy it, but you yeah. know, the, the, it's the whole money issue. And like you said, mm -hmm. there's more about that than any other um, topic in the New Testament, um, whether it be money directly or um, being put in charge as mm -hmm. the steward or the, many of Jesus' parables dealing with stewardship uh, of others' care and stuff. And if we don't look at everything on earth as the Lord's, and um, we don't own anything. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I like what you pointed out earlier that uh, when you finished Bible college that there was a surplus mm -hmm. because God is more than enough. Yes. Right. He is more than enough, and that's excellent that there yeah. was money made available to help others, mm -hmm. and that's, that's, a, that's a good godly spirit. Right. Good, good godly spirit. Very good. Anybody else want to add to that before we? Well, I just agree, and the fact that it, that's, you know, what you said, you want other people to experience what you've experienced, what God promises, mm -hmm. His blessings. You want to experience it, you experience it, and then you want to share it with everybody else. So what's the best way to really pull them out of that world and believing everything that the world believes them, that tries to tell them? to believe in God's word, that that's where true happiness mm -hmm. is. Some of us drop off when the money, when the teaching turns to money though. <laughs> Some people drop off that, at that point. I, I became a Christian at age 15. That's mm -hmm. when I gave my heart to the Lord and was taught to pay tithes at age 16. I've been paying tithes since mm -hmm. I was age 16. And I have absolutely no regrets about learning that feature mm -hmm. because it's been a, a major blessing in my life. When he says, test me. Mm -hmm. So test him. Mm -hmm. Just don't pay tithes for the whole month. See, see, yeah. see what happens that whole month. <laughs> I did. Yeah. Is that right? Car broke down. The bills didn't get paid on time. <laughs> uh, oh, I got to do this consistently. You have to be intentional and learn that. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you very much. I think you've helped us to wrap up the program for today. And we hope you're getting your money straight while you're listening. Yeah. So all the time we have uh, today. We'll be back again next week with another good program to answer your questions. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. God bless you for now. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We are able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com. <laughs>